Okay, hi everybody. Today we're here to talk to uh, Matthew. Matthew's, um, what would you call yourself, Matthew? A principal? At uh, co co founder, general partner. Yeah, sure. Uh, co founder, general partner sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Tenacious Ventures is one of the leading ag, ag, agri tech or ag tech, uh, probably deep tech, lots of robotic stuff, investment places in Australia. And Matthew, you're also a director at Agri Tech Australia. Um, you want to tell yeah. us a bit about those things? Yeah, sure. So Tenacious Ventures is a early stage, dedicated early stage venture capital fund. Uh, we focus, focus exclusively on agri tech innovation, um, largely originated in Australia, but, but all of it with global application. So we're looking for innovators who are going to you know, deliver impact and help transition agriculture to you know, carbon neutral and climate change resilient future. Uh, we do a lot of cool stuff in Australia, but nowhere near enough of it makes its way outside of Australia. So that's very much uh, what we see the role for Tenacious as being a kind of early and largely lead investor in kind of season series A. Um, you know, broadly to that point of like Australia doing a lot of stuff that doesn't get out of the country uh, enough. That's really what uh, Oz Agritech is for. So Oz Agritech is an industry uh, led initiative to sort of create a peak body for the emerging agri-tech industry in Australia. We, you know, historically we've largely invested in agricultural research um, to improve the efficiency of Australian agriculture, which is a great objective. But when it comes down to it, Australia can only feed about hundred million people and there's, you know, like 9 billion of us who need to be fed. Um, so there's also a massive opportunity for those innovations that start in Australia to find really big and potentially even larger opportunities outside the country. And that's really what Oz Agritech is for. Oz Agritech is there to provide support and information and you know, um, help people think about that global opportunity, which last, you know, some estimates we've recently seen put the global pro uh, market for products and services in, in agri-tech at around $500 billion. So it's a big market. And we just, as a country, you know, we don't really focus on it yet. So that's really what Oz Agritech is there to do to sort of create a bit of focus. Yeah, that's really cool, right? I think it's a, it's a very common story in a lot of Australian technology. We've, we've got a couple of guys and a dog as our total market here, um, but we've got some good ideas and we need to get them out. Uh, let me ask you a question though. When you when you say you know we have a lot of good things going on here, we just need to kind of scale out and get global. Where, where are you drawing from? Universities, SMEs, companies, two mates in a room. Oh look, it's a bit of everything. I mean, so Australian agriculture is significant, right? It's it's a it's a it's a sixty billion dollar kind of farm gate output industry, and so because of its size and and it's still a significant uh, GDP. Um, contributor to to the Australian economy. It's you know raw raw component of I don't know it's six or seven percent value added component is north of ten percent. So it's a significant GDP element. So there's lots of opportunity there for companies you know to pursue. Now whether those companies start as a university license or a university spin out or you know uh, a couple of people who see an opportunity or a farmer who gets frustrated with with what's currently out there and decides to back themselves to you know like all of that is 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 the source um, of innovation but I think especially for the stuff that's um, researched you know like where there is this problem can we find a solution for it often at, at the original conception is can we find a solution for it for Australian farmers um, and so we just kind of say that's that's awesome and you know growing the 60 billion to 100 billion will require a lot of innovation and that'll all be good for the country as well. But in addition to that, you know, we can potentially add tens of billions of dollars of additional revenue for those companies by helping them access markets overseas. And the great thing about Australian Ag is there are a lot of other parts of the world that kind of work in a similar way. Um, and maybe the third point, a third answer to your question is one of the reasons why there is a lot of innovation in Australia, uh, or in and around agri-food, is because we're not very protected in, in terms of you know a lot of a lot of other agricultural economies have subsidies and all kinds of sort of domestic protection. Australia has very little of that. In fact, the 
you know, I've heard it argued that our investment in R&D is our protection. And up until, you know, it, it's worked decently well. We, we have um, maintained pretty good productivity improvements uh, over the last couple of decades as a result of the investment. That's starting to tail off a bit now. So we, we need to kind of kick it up. But if, if you're like a founder thinking about starting an ag tech business, then great. You know, it's awesome to have the Australian market to start in. But also, you know, if, if the global opportunity, if you can double or triple or more your total revenue by looking outside the country, then for sure you want to do that as well. Yeah. So so one thing I see quite a lot of, like, um, because I've had a, a bit of a look in, you know, maybe the verticals versus horizontals. I, I think things like ag tech, plain tech, deep tech, they're almost all kind of meaningless because they're all, all application space. If, if we're working on robotics and AI and deep technology, sure. Yes, there needs to be a, a big application for that technology in that vertical, but I uh, really just just because we've been working on this doesn't mean we can't bend over there. It, it seems like you're on that page. Yeah, I would I would say I, I think there I'm, I'm a big fan of Venn diagrams, and I and I think I, I see it as 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 more of a Venn diagram. So so there's, there's certainly the field of what's possible, right, and that's that robotics and, and automation and vision systems and all of those kind of core technologies absolutely change what's possible. Um, what's meaningful or what's economic, I think is where the verticality comes into it. So when you look at you know, autonomy in agriculture, it's, it, it won't be enough to just take any old robotic platform and you know, to work in ag, it'll also have to, satisfy other key elements like you know can be owned by people who are in regional areas can be serviced by people who you know by regionally based businesses um you know is is able to solve kind of specific problems so i think it's really when those two overlap is when you kind of get moved from the what the technology is capable of and why you might invest in sort of foundation capability versus why you would also invest in okay you know, we're going to leverage that that capability, but then um, you know push it into specific horizontals because eventually you've got to solve the kind of business problem as well as the technology problem. I, I quite like that, Ben. I hope that's not trademarked or something because I'm working. No, it. no, but I'm sure if anybody in my team watches this, they'll roll their eyes because I talk about Venn diagrams a lot. No, no, but um, so. I, I think you've used very different words to get to a point I often find myself talking around, which is if you're inside the company, if you're inside the technology, it is very interesting to talk about the technology. It is very interesting to talk about what is possible, what has been made possible, what could be possible. But this, how is it meaningful to everyone else? How is it meaningful to the sector? It might get a bit neglected. So, so from your side of the table, it, you know, if I was making an approach to you, what are you interested in hearing a bit, a bit about both, hearing more about one than the other? Yeah, so we're an early stage investor. So um, what, and, and, and what that means is, you know, we will typically come in maybe even as the first sort of um, full-time investor that a, that a startup might, um, might take investment from. Yeah. And it'll, it'll be the case, you know, that there's going to be, working product but maybe still in kind of prototype of the concept stage there'll be customers but maybe because they love what it does rather than they're paying heaps of money right so um both of those things do need to be there right so so clearly the capability has to be there and it can't just be something that you know is is made up of kind of bailing twine and and and, and masking tape um but there's also got to be a customer who probably is on the other side of the equation, which is they they care. So so take Swarm Farm Robotics as a, as a good example. And, you know, one of our first investments in a company that we're really excited about who has massive global application. Um, one of their first key applications is in variable rate weed management. Now it just so happens that autonomy and sea and spray technology go really well together. And, and so being able to build an autonomous, you know, agricultural vehicle platform that can then have something added to it means you can kind of just autonomously 
walk about in a field. It's, it's small, so it can get out of that field when larger equipment wouldn't be able to get out there because after rain, you get rain, you get sun, you get weed emergence. And so that combo, it's, it's very much the case that autonomy, you know, vision systems, all of those things, the technologies make it possible. But really what the grower cares about is that they can get on top of a weed problem early. And so they don't have this massive emergence of weeds and they can do it in a way that's very efficient and, and uses the minimum amount of herbicide or, or could even use a non-chemical way to destroy the weeds, which will give them a benefit of a lower production cost or removal of some synthetic chemistry from their product, which might have a downstream kind of benefit in their supply chain. So it's really those two things you were talking about, which is it's got to be that, you know, there's there's new capabilities and, and, and sort of the, the core of the team has to have their real hands around the technology. But in the end, it's got to be solving a specific problem that's worth money to people because um, otherwise it's just technology for technology's sake. Let, let me ask you a question about small farm in particular a little, a little bit because I think it's a really good example of something I hear quite a lot. So I hear quite a lot that VCs want to invest into high, you know, high capex companies. They want to invest into actual robots where you have to make something. And having seen Form Farm, I just let everyone else know that when Matthew says little, it's little in the agriculture sector. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Compared to a massive combine harvester, yes. Yeah. It looks like the size of a, a tractor that most people would think as a, as a kind of tractor you would see on the prototypical farm is about the size of the swamp farm. Yep. Yeah, so can you give us some indication of what kind of uh, capex is involved in that? What kind of horizons for um, you know, return? Why that's interesting to you? Or uh, you, don't, you don't need to go into details, but just what, why you'd consider a proposition like that, just hopefully to help our community a bit Hey, un uh, let them understand that there's VCs out there that no, we need to spend money on CapEx to get started. Yeah, look, I think there's a, a couple of ways to answer that question. Um, the first answer is that, you know, I can really only answer on behalf of Tenacious Ventures and, and we specifically are very comfortable with hardware and manufacturing because it, it's, it's one of the things that we have a deep background in and it's one of the things that we saw as being really necessary um, because a lot of agriculture, you know, intersects with manufacturing, whether it's on the input side or the on-farm equipment side or in the food manufacturing and processing. So, so you've got to be comfortable with hardware. And not all VCs funds are. Some funds, you know, by the nature of their, the way they invest, invest, you know, across a range of different industries. Um, so that's the first. The, the second is, I, I think it's really a business model question, which is that, you um, building something before you sell it always has a balance between you know, a capital efficiency balance. I mean, software is the same, right? You, you typically have to invest millions of dollars in software before you can start yielding um, revenue from it. But software tends to be a little bit more incremental in that way, right? Because you can build a bit of it and build just enough to get a few customers and then you build a bit more and then get a bit more. If you look at the total, the total is kind of the same. So some of it really is just comfort in a business model or and or the degree to which the business model kind of solves for that problem. So once you, in, in a hardware world, kind of once you get up to a certain level, you do want to look at the equipment as equipment and ideally look for different kinds of financing. It's actually, it's, it's probably more uh, from the founder side, like, selling equity in order to build um, inventory is, is not very capital efficient for the founders either. So I think both investors and founders want to find better ways. I mean, there is an inevitability to, you've got to get to a certain level, you've got to get to a certain scale, you've got to have manufacturing um, streamlined enough that you can then, it looks more like equipment than, you know, kind of raw tech. Um, but I think that's part of it and, and probably for us, part of why we would say, you know, a sector specific investor in these cases, um, you know, we have a particular view, We've, we're comfortable with those phases, we kind of know what they look like and also we can add a lot of value in terms of helping people build maturity around their manufacturing. Um, 
So it's, it's not so much a black and white thing as it, as it really boils down to how are you going to solve those specifics in your business model? Um, and that, that might be on the founder side. It's like, you've got to think about that a lot about, you know, how do we kind of get out of this phase of having to just keep selling and selling equity to, to finance the sort of um, equipment side of the business? So I'm going to attempt to paraphrase what I think I just heard you say. Um, please let me know if I've got it wrong. But, but it was something like you're, you're very, very comfortable with investing into high capex, high start, uh, long, long lead time before first revenue type companies just so long as there's a good plan to get to revenue, the revenue looks like it's going to be significant once we get there and the likelihood of execution is acceptable. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's a decent summary. I would say, you know, finesse it slightly around that there's got to be an element, even in those early phases, there's got to be an element of the business model, like a unique insight and understanding in the business model that says, why will it be possible? For us to do that not just how are we going to um because you know anyone can wave their hand and then say we're going to and then and then the second part is um you know you, you still solving for capital efficiency is, is super important it's important for everybody because um you know someone has to pay um ideally you can quickly move to a way that it's incorporated into the what the customer pays for the total benefit that the product or service gives them and, and you're open to all kinds of things like hardware as a transaction robotics as a service so, uh, software as a service for upgrades or, or you have a particular view on that now again i, I would say the, the answer is business model right if 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 you know weeding as a service makes sense and or, or actually you know a good example would be um harvesting right uh, like you look at a horticulture in australia at the moment um, labor availability is a really big problem, but the generally um, growers of orchards and things are used to kind of paying on a piece rate or an hourly rate for the fruit to be picked off the tree and they want it done in, you know, particular way. So you could see a business model that might make sense to sort of say, right, we're just going to go and charge the same. We're going to charge exactly the same as you would get charged if we were a labor hire company, except our labor is going to be you know, mostly robotic. Um, I'm not advocating or not advocating that as a business model. I'm just giving it as an example of it boils down to the specifics and, and that's, so maybe, you know, we're talking somewhat about elements of what's investable. So investable also is the team who understands why their, their business model is going to prevail. That's, that's, come, that's coming through uh, strongly and clear. Like I, I do hear a fair bit of... Um... You know, it's gonna it's gonna be hard for us to robust us to make something because investors are only interested in fintech apps. But that's the complete opposite to what you've just said. What what I feel like you're saying is if it fits what the market wants, if it fits what the users need, if there's some logic behind it, if if it's believable you'll get there and everything stacks up and balances, you you're willing to listen, you're willing to engage, you're willing to yeah, yeah. check something and yeah, which so sorry, Matthew. I'm not really asking a question. I'm just celebrating. Uh, no, sure, but I mean the point. The point of this is is to provide content that that gives people a point of view and a perspective. And I think it's, it's definitely helpful to to you know repeat it for for clarity. Um, but I think yeah, there are plenty of good examples of that. Um, you know, swarm farms go to market is 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 different. There's you know, Green Atlas are doing really good stuff, but but in a in a completely different way of presenting their product to market you know, ripe robotics, you know, different again, the is different again. And so, you know, like you could look at each of those products and, and find core elements from a technical point of view that are the same. You know, they've, they've got to be able to navigate. They've got to be able to sense and perceive the world around them. They have to be able to move autonomously or semi-autonomously around obstacles and be safe and not run over things or people and blah, 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 blah. But none of that really matters if you get the business model wrong, right? If you go to the farmer and say, oh, you're going to have to pay a million bucks up front and then blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, no. Yeah. You know, so, so those are the things that really um, boil down to it. It's, it's, it's not a technology thing. It's not a hardware or software thing. It's a, you know, do you understand the customer well enough and understand where the money is, yeah. right? 
such that you can craft a business model that in then deals with the constraints that you have that you know somehow you've got to pay for the build cost of the platform or somehow you've got to pay for the energy that goes into the system i think it's a really good perspective and i i actually quite like venn diagrams too so sorry sorry about it taking it's not a fan but that overlap I'm, i can really see it just becoming more and more solid the more you talk it's really like it you know, if you can write an academic journal paper about one cog in the machine, almost so what? That's kind of cool, but that's not the point. The point is, can you build a system that's useful and adoptable? Yeah. 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 And economically meaningful. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I feel like I'm going to be quoting you some. <laughs> okay. That's all right. So I think, um, it's probably worth you saying some words on how you like to be approached. If someone, if someone's out sure. there in the community who's got an idea that they think might be up your alley, what should they do? Yeah, well, so if you, I mean, you know, kind of reflecting on 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 those elements, like um, that's what we're interested in understanding, and and we're interested in understanding those things in preference to you know, like how much money are you looking for, or you know anything like that um so as far as tenacious ventures is concerned our i mean obviously warm introduction and all those sorts of things if you can swing it um works you know we're all available on linkedin um we're all on twitter and and all the kind of various platforms so you know take every opportunity you can to start a dialogue not hey here's the best investment opportunity you've ever seen but like um a dialogue that would be in in the interest of us understanding why you've got a unique perspective um, is is one way to just kind of you know get get some interest. Um, we do have our preference is that there's a form on our website and we ask a couple of specific questions. It's not big, but the questions really go to those kind of core insights that we want to see. And and so you know it, it's 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 regular and routine that people come to us that way even if we will you know oftentimes have a conversation through linkedin or or, or or back and forth on twitter or something like that but we'll still usually request that they go to the trouble of filling out the form um just because we kind of want to know the answers to those questions and get some insight into how much the team has kind of thought about those specific questions you know it's 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 not like it's a great essay or or you know a, a doctoral thesis or anything like that it's it's pretty simple but just gives us some key insight and then we're decently systematic internally about how we how we kind of process things from there so, so i think you hit another one of my pet peeves I, I seem to be constantly repeating myself um to people in the industry like you know maybe you wrote a thesis at uni that's cool um if you're asking someone for money start with hey mate what's your name you, you don't need to give them the 300 page explanation of everything on day one if you yeah. get through the gates due diligence will come and some at some stage you want to look through that but often it's seemingly at the early stage often it's which partner of the fund would be best to have a look and that that can be a five minute conversation to just any of them like Oh, we do this, this, and this, and this, and you might be interested because of this and this and this, and then they then the you know, fund will go away and have a look and go, okay, well we should send person X back because that's kind of their thing. It it feels like this entry into deal flow is something you're talking about. You, you've got the form, which feels like a maybe a more formalized way to do the you know typical Silicon Bay Valley uh, coffee chat. Are we, am I talking about the same thing or have I gone off the tangent? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, like, I, I, I guess, um, you know, we, we, we're a new fund. I mean, we're A, we're a small team. B, we're sector specific, which is which is uh, uncommon on both fronts. Um, and C, you know, we've mostly existed in COVID times, right? So uh, we, you know, we only closed the fund a little over a year ago. And we won't, so we've only been investing for a year. In fact, I think our first close was... Uh, on, on the day that the ASX still has its largest ever recorded drop. Um, so we were, you know, we, yeah, we were born right into uh, the teeth of, of COVID. So we're, we're super comfortable with remote everything. Um, I think at least two of the investments we've made, we've never physically met. 
the teams were investing in. Um, so I, I would say just, just in the interest of efficiency, I mean, we're not precious. Um, we're a small team, we're sector specific, so it doesn't really matter who, who you talk to um, first. It's, it's more a matter of, you know, we're quite opinionated about um, what we want to know. And, and it's really that, that kind of combo of what is it, you know, what is your unique insight about why whatever innovation you've got is going to kind of unlock an opportunity that's that's inaccessible to others um, because of that combo of your way of looking at it and your way of doing what you do, sort of creating a unique or different or new pathway um, is also common, right? So again, going back to the, the kind of Swarm Farm example or, or our most recently announced investment um, into Rapid Aim, sometimes the innovation just opens up a new way of doing things. And so just creates an economic opportunity that really isn't available until you have access to the innovation. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. And I think um, it translates over all of Australia. I think you've already given the example of, you know, we produce enough food here for 100 million people, but there's, we well, said 9 billion on the planet. I haven't been paying attention. I thought we're running up to seven, but whatever. Well, I, I, I'm always looking at the future. Yeah. <laughs> so, so new, but, but, I, but I think that's a key example of, um, you know, you've got these different stages of innovation, maybe incremental, which is just a better way to do something you're already doing. And maybe that's a bit boring and maybe that's not something you know, that get VCs excited. But as soon as you get onto the boundary of transformative innovation, like this, this is such a better way to do what we're already doing. Now we can do completely new things. So maybe we can add an extra zero to how many people would be just because we're that much more efficient. I think you're already starting to get into the realm of that's an interesting business proposition. I, I would personally, I've been an engineer for maybe too long. I'd personally say get sh uh, strictly into radical or disruptive innovation. That's when you start to lose these things again because they start to think, oh, well, you just, you're off in the clouds. It's all vapor. It's a little bit too scary. So, it's, you know, for me, it's, it's that little triangle of innovation in the sweet spot of you know, enable something that otherwise wasn't possible uh, so we can scale up. And, uh, you've just got me all excited because I feel like we're on the same page. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you used the phrase adoptable before, and I mean, that's that's key. So I would say um, our view isn't necessarily that the core element will just be a technological innovation because because often innovation can come in business model innovation. Um, but we, we are an impact fund. And so to deliver impact and returns, we need these things to be adoptable on a global scale or, or certainly, you know, on a significant geographic scale. Yeah. And so that's, that's really where that kind of um, thinking around, you know, what are the elements, what is, what, what are the keys that are preventing this kind of change at the moment? And, and are they, you know, technological in nature? Are they, you know, is it, is it, is it to do with the incentives that are present in the market or not in the market? Um, yeah, can be a whole range of things. And we don't have a preference specifically for one over the other. Um, but the combination of the team, the innovation, the insights and the kind of approach, the business model approach have to promise something that's going to be unique and different and differentiated. Now, again, you know, that won't exist in totality yet. And part of our job is to be prepared to invest in things that we believe are true and, 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 and a team whose vision that we can share and can see early evidence of things and provide some of the money required to kind of create more evidence, run more experiments to create evidence to say, see, this, this is working, you know, what's true in two years time means that our kind of hypothesis is more proven, is more, you know, is closer to being real. It's really actually music to my ears. I'll ask you one more question, if that's all right. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty broad one, but in your opinion, how can we, the community, make ourselves more investable? Yeah, I was thinking about um, that as you, as you were kind of mentioning before about the venture scale. And, and I think that you, you also kind of said in, in the lead up that, um, you know, there's a bit of a perception that, that, VC is a bit impenetrable or, or, or um, sort of difficult to approach. I, I think that 
key thing to understand is that venture investing is, is a particular kind of investing. And so really understanding, the first thing is understanding what the investor wants to get out of it, right? And what, what, what that kind of looks like, what, a, what for them a venture scale investment looks like. So if we said no, it doesn't mean like, you know, no one wants to hear their, their child is ugly or whatever. And that's not the message. The message is, you know, um, we're in the business of, of training people for high jump or distance running or ocean swimming or something like that. And, you know, maybe your child is going to be better at math or science or art or some creative pursuit. Um, so, you know, in, in, especially in Australia, I think that, that that can be significant and in ag because ag's a good, you know, it's a strong market and you can, you can build a very successful company without leaving Australia and without growing to, you know, venture scale. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing is understanding um, what the investor is looking for from Tenacious's point of view, we're looking for a globally meaningful, um, you know, early stage innovations in agri-food that will deliver impact and returns. Um, and for, you know, like, like venture return is, is many, many times our, our investment back. That's, that's what our investors, the expectation ultimately is, is, you know, when people talk about venture scale. Mm. Um, so that, you know, that there are plenty of good and promising and really exciting companies that we see that just don't fit our style of investment, but we'll go on and have gone on to raise money and, and we'll go on to grow and become profitable um, in, and, and you know, be meaningful, meaningful to the founders, meaningful to the users in many ways, just not the you know, sometimes quite narrow way that, that we view the, the kind of opportunities we're looking for. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, right? So you, just because you, you and I may not fit for this opportunity, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong yeah, with me. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, like, like it's certainly true too that there, there are. We 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 have this phrase that that, that we talk about um, called basically is it an awareness problem or a comparison problem? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, especially in early stages, people make good progress but it's largely because it's an early market and so most people you meet most potential customers you meet haven't seen any solutions yet hmm. and that's you know it's exciting but if you don't have the insight to sort of say okay but what's it going to look like when customers can find alternatives and how are we going to command their attention then and why is it that we can be first to have that conversation and and still be first even after they've gone out to the market and looked at the alternatives. Um, so I think those are sometimes when it just doesn't, it doesn't kind of pass the bar of, you know, able to, or, or in the hands of people who've kind of done enough work yet to really understand um, the difference between those two things. Awesome. Um, I'm conscious of your time. So I think we should leave it at that. And I, I think the, the key is we should all just talk. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, again, really only answering on behalf of the Tenacious team, but um, yeah, I, we're, we're, we're more than happy, um, you know, we'll always want to hear from people, you know, obviously eventually prefer that, that we hear from you in, in a kind of, in that slightly structured way so we can kind of apply a consistent um, lens over, over opportunity as we start to evaluate it. But yeah, I mean, we're all very accessible, not hidden behind uh, some impenetrable barriers of any kind. Uh, hidden right, cool. hidden right, big fancy desk. Yeah, yeah, that's all. No, 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 no. Very, uh, pretty, pretty accessible, I would say. All good. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. No worries. My pleasure.